Hey everyone, Sam here, otherwise known as FPL Pricey. Today we're going to take a look at my team selection ahead of game week two, answer all of the big key questions ahead of the deadline and whether or not it could be already the week to think about using that triple captaincy chip. In the meantime, if you could leave a like and subscribe to the channel, that'd be greatly appreciated. For now though, Let's crack on with the show. Right then, before we get cracking, as per usual, a quick reminder that my mini league is live. The code is above and it's, if you can't read it, RQ7NIR. Make sure you get involved before it's too late because I will lock off the league probably in a couple of game weeks time. Also, all of the data today is provided by Fantasy Football Hub. If you wanted to get a discounted rate at the start of the season, the link is in the description below. In the meantime, though, let's have a look at my game week one team performance. 70 points overall. I am pretty happy with that. I won't go through every single player one by one, but a quick recap on where I was pre-deadline. I initially had a trio of, I think it was Jota, Eze and Gavardiol in ahead of Fernandez and Kunku and Porro. I did move that on the final day. I think it was after my deadline stream, so... You would have seen it if you follow me on X. Do make sure that you do go and do so if you're new around here. But my final decision was based mainly around a couple of factors. One, I really wanted Bruno regardless. And two, it looked like Rodri wasn't going to be playing for Man City, therefore making Gavardiol an ever so slightly weaker pick. And two as well, because Eze had the transfer rumour circulating and the active release clause still going on before the deadline. That has now passed. So it looks much more likely he's going to stay. But overall, I'm still pretty happy with the structure. And I am also glad that I do have Bruno Fernandes, who looked absolutely fantastic and very unlucky not to get anything from that Fulham game. Points all across my defence, all across my back line and in goal. So eight points from Raya. Really happy with that. Don't expect him to be getting bonus points any time later on in the season. This feels like a bit of a one-off. But Trent, I am expecting big things from, from the bonus category. Created a lot of good chances. Looked absolutely phenomenal, especially in that second half. And whilst he was brought off early, I wouldn't expect that to continue. So really happy with Trent. Porro obviously got the goal. Absolutely overjoyed with that. Wasn't really expecting it to come from a cross and a header. More from the open play side of things. But we take those and it's a bit of a bonus. Paul as well, maybe slightly fortunate to keep the clean sheets. Got the yellow card, got subbed off before any potential clean sheet wipeout but of course they did hang on to it against Southampton anyway regardless in midfield went without Salah but Saka did do the business for me so goal and assist for him really happy with his performance and I'm happy that so far at least it seems like he is the 10 to 10.5 million asset that I would have preferred to go with and it seems like the right choice in very very early days of course Fernandez already discussed, unlucky, Nkunku got taken off early, we'll talk about that of course in just a moment's time. Minte as well, very unlucky to get taken off just before half time with a concussion protocol substitution, we'll go into that in a minute's time as well, but did get the assist. Smithrow, nothing there, but looked promising in the number 10 role and has a good fixture this week. Up top, Haaland did the business as you'd expect. Standard goal for him and one bonus point, I think, in the end. Or two bonus points in the yellow card, in fact. And Isaac got the assist for the one goal for Newcastle. So overall, pretty happy with the performance. There are issues in my lineup, though. Obviously, Barco on the bench is going to be something we need to discuss today as well. So in the meantime, let's crack on with the show and start looking at the problems and challenges facing us ahead of game week two. Well, well, well then. So we have a lot more information to go off of now that we've had game week one in the bank. And unfortunately, there are minutes risks that maybe we didn't fully consider prior to game week one. I've got one of them, or actually three of these four in my team, but one of the main minutes risks is Valentin Barco, who not only got benched in game week one, I actually, even at the start of this week, was in denial about that. I thought that maybe he's got a slight injury, maybe it's a knock, and he'll come back in, because he looked really good in pre-season, he was on set pieces. But what do I know, eh? I got that one wrong, clearly, because it looks like he's going to be securing a loan move to Sevilla very, very soon. Now, for anyone asking the question on whether or not he's going to be price-locked, the information is slightly unreliable and slightly fuzzy. So for what it's worth, I don't think he's going to drop in price quickly anyway. So I wouldn't panic about this, but I don't think he gets price locked 
necessarily when the move goes through. I think it's when FPL take him out of the game as an option. So we have to be very wary of that. And he could go down to 3.9. Now, as someone who's in my side and, prob and I'm fully aware that he could go down to 3.9, I'm going to hold on to him this week. I'm not going to sell him. I'm not going to make a move. One, because even though I've got a free transfer to use, I personally think that that one free transfer, I can roll that and probably find a better use for it in the next few game weeks. And look, I'm on a wildcard game week six strategy as it stands. So I've only really got to hold on to him for another four game weeks regardless. Even if he drops in price by 0 0.1, 0 0.2, which I think is an absolute worst case scenario, he's probably just going to be sat last on my bench every week anyway. And I've got enough depth in my squad that I'm probably not going to need to rely on him. And if I do, then I'm probably not that far away from pulling the wild card anyway. And also there's probably other issues that I'd sort first because I've got no money in my bank. And even if I sold him now for another 4 million option, none of the 4 millions are good enough that I'd want to start them in the next four or five game weeks anyway. So all of this is kind of a, a null point. I don't really need to get rid of him until I need to start playing him. And I'm not that bothered by 0.1 million at this point in the season when it's on a 4 million defender because I'm realistically not looking to upgrade him to a 4.5 and I don't even have that 0.5 anyway. So I don't think it's a massive issue. But obviously, if you're in a structure where you've got a 4 million starting defender and Barco is that guy or one of the guys then obviously it becomes a bit more of a problem and you might want to look to get rid of him. However, I don't think he's going to be one of the main transfers out this week. So I really wouldn't panic about it. Even if he leaves, most of us have got him last on the bench. So I think whilst it's annoying, I would prefer the incorrect assumptions be put on the 4 million defenders I'm not going to start every week. So we it looks like 23% of managers might have called this one slightly wrong. And I myself have definitely called it wrong if he does go to Sevilla. So hands up on that one. But I don't think it's a massive issue in our teams going forwards. Now, the two players next to him on the minutes risks are Gerald Kwanzaa and Pedro Porro. Now, if you've got all three of these players, which I've seen teams out there that do have all three of these, then maybe looking to transfer out at least one of them would be wise. Now, I think I'll cover Poro quickly because he has been seen in training today. So good, great shout out to um, FPL Rashford and FPL Focal, who both did a bit of detective work, hopefully on screen now, that shows Poro appearing in training from the back. And you can tell via the tattoo on his right leg, which is some really good investigative journalism there, I must say. So it looks like Poro is going to be OK. and. You would think as long as he's in training, he's going to start in game week two against Everton. He's so crucial to the way they play. So I'm not that worried about him, although I do own him. So it's one to keep an eye on. Now, Jarrell Kwanzaa, I talked about earlier on in the week. I think he is more of a significant doubt to play this week. But unless you've got a bench where it's Barco and another non-playing defender... I would probably still take a risk on Kwanzaa starting. Now, he got substituted at halftime against uh, Ipswich, as we know, because he wasn't winning enough duels, as, as the quote suggests on screen, of course. However, that doesn't necessarily mean he can't come back in against Brentford. It looks unlikely that Brentford are going to play Tony. And in terms of duels... Kwanzaa was being outmatched by Delap, who is another big striker with a big aerial presence who is winning a lot of the battles physically. Now, if Tony's not playing, they'll probably start with Sharda, Mbwemo and Wissa up top again, or at least two of those players. None of them are absolute units who are going to be a real force that will cause Kwanzaa any issues in terms of duels, and that might give Slot another excuse to start the player that he'd had a lot of faith in in pre-season and he likes in terms of a passing system. I think Kwanzaa is also a young player and you don't, as a manager, want your head to your, your player's head to drop too much. So I don't think all hope is lost on Kwanzaa. I think there's a relatively decent chance that he could start. I think if I was putting a percentage on it, I'd probably give him a 30, maybe 40% chance of starting Kanate with the 60 to 70. So the other thing with Kwanzaa is if he's not going to start the game, it is pretty unlikely he comes off the bench. I think 
what happened in game week one, we won't see happen every single week with Liverpool. So I think you can probably take a risk on him starting. And as long as you've got a playing defender on your bench, that's probably OK. Now, obviously, if you've got Barco as your first sub, that's a bit more of an issue. And maybe you could look at selling him. He is down at 4.4, though. So unless you've already moved off of him, it's going to be tough to move in another defender that's any de any any good at this point because most of us don't have 0 0.5 in the bank if you do the first player i'd probably be looking at right now is potentially robinson although there were some random rumors online about a wrist injury let's wait and see on that i don't think that that's a big problem i think that might be falsified but we'll see we'll have to check that out closer to the deadline now the final player on the minutes risks is christopher and kunku now before I go into him completely, I wanted to look at his positioning as well as the minutes he got in game week one. So let's flick across to that now. So Nkunku played 58 minutes for Chelsea in game week one, which was disappointing for owners, including myself. We were maybe hoping for a little bit more because he had got good minutes in pre-season. But Nkunku himself has said that his main goal is to stay fit at the start of this year. So I wouldn't say I was massively surprised to see him get taken off early. I think the fact that it was before 60 has put it in a fancy Premier League lens more than otherwise it would have been if it was 62, 63. Because of course he gets less points for coming off before the 60 minute mark. I think if he went off at 65, none of us would have really batted an eyelid. We would have thought, OK, so it's against Man City. They're chasing the game. They've got pacey wingers coming off the bench that will give their fullbacks problems, especially Rico Lewis down that side, as you can see. And Kunku, via the data given to me by Fantasy Football Hub, was very wide left. He was playing that left winger role, which, again, he's not usually played in. He would have been probably taken off around the hour mark to give Lewis something different to think about as Chelsea were trying to chase the game. Now, the reason I wanted to show his positioning heat map so clearly now is that I don't expect this to be his standard position for, for the rest of the season. I don't think he usually operates this wide left. We've seen him play on the left before, but usually it's much more central and it's almost an inside forward role. This was truly a winger role. This was very wide left. He didn't get into the box that much. You can see a li some little blue patches in the box around that left, that left corner, but really not much to shout about. And I think as more of a natural winger, Neto was brought on to provide that width, even though Maresca knows that Nkunku is the first choice, the first option. The other thing to take into account with Chelsea and their system is that they played three, not necessarily holding mids, but functional midfielders that weren't deployed as a, a two with a one up for, like in a 10 role per se. Against Man City, that makes complete sense, by the way. You want Lavia, Caicedo and Enzo all in there, providing a bank of three that makes them more difficult to break down. Against weaker opposition... I think it's very unlikely they play all three of those players in that deeper three and they'll probably relinquish one of them to have that 10 role incorporated into the system again. Now that number 10 role could suit quite a few players, but I think in particular Nkunku could be the guy that drifts back into the 10 and then another winger takes his place out on the wide left. He could optionally also play up top as well because Jackson didn't exactly impress in game week one with Palmer going into the number 10 as well. So all I would say with Nkunku is there are plenty of different positions he can play. That makes him a very high utility player for Maresca. He was being talked up very, very highly by Maresca pre-season and looked really good. So I just wouldn't lose faith this early in a player that got hooked just before the 60th minute in a game that realistically we weren't expecting much from him anyway and they were chasing the game as well. Now the final thing to mention on Nkunku and for what it's worth I'm recording this during the Chelsea game on Thursday evening you'll see this on Friday morning so if Nkunku goes off injured in that game I'm really sorry about this you can probably skip this section and definitely get rid of him or at least bench him for a week. But if he gets through that game unscathed, I still don't think it's a massive issue. It's early season. They're building up fitness. They're building up minutes. Let's see how many minutes he gets in that game. And I would say if he gets anything less than 75 minutes, he's been taken off to start for the weekend. That would be my assumption. And it's also worth saying as well that the players that are starting around him 
in this fixture on the Thursday night are three of the players I would have said are most likely to take his place in the starting 11 anyway. So Mudrick, Dewsbury Hall and Neto all start. Those are the three players that I'd probably suggest are the most likely to be competing directly with Nkunku for a game week two starting position. And they're all starting tonight as well. So let's see how that pans out. But for what it's worth, I own Nkunku. I'm planning on starting him. I think he's got a great fixture against Wolves. So I'm really not too scared about him yet. But obviously, as soon as I finish recording this video, I'll check to see whether he came off at a reasonable time and whether or not he came off with an injury in the Thursday, Thursday night game. And obviously that will colour my opinion going into the deadline. For now though, he's in and I'm happy to start him. Right then, so the big discussion this week will be around not just captaincy, but whether or not it's too early in the season or too risky to use that triple captaincy chip on Erling Haaland. Before we go into that discussion in particular, I think it is worth noting because there's a, a pretty good proportion of managers who don't have Erling Haaland, what they should be doing with their captaincy. And the expected points from Fantasy Football Hub suggests that you're probably not that badly out of luck this week. Mo Salah obviously did really well in game week one. He's got a good home fixture against Brentford, who at the moment look OK, but they're not an elite defence by any means. And Flecken leaves a lot to be desire desired as a goalkeeper too. So I wouldn't really be that scared at all captaining Mo Salah ahead of Haaland if you don't have Haaland already. The second thing to mention here is I definitely, definitely would not be ripping up my side after one game week to bring in Erling, bring in Erling Haaland for a hit just to make sure the armband is on him this game week. I don't think the difference is that vast that you need to be taking probably a minus four or up to a minus eight to get to him, get to him in game week two. Ipswich is a good fixture. It obviously is. But there are factors that make it not absolutely ideal. And whilst quite a few people are going to be triple captaining, I'm sure, I don't think Salah's so far behind that it's worth ripping up your team for. So that's what I'd say on the no Haaland camp. And also there are a few other differential options as well. Eze comes out really well against West Ham at home. Really unlucky not to return in game week one, of course. Saka, De Bruyne, both decent enough options. I'd probably say with De Bruyne, he is below Haaland and in the same 11, so it's going to be tough to argue that. But there are options out there that you could consider if you really wanted to force it and be differential with your captaincy. Some of you don't have either premium. And in that case, obviously, this becomes a lot more interesting. Saka could be a good option, even away at Aston Villa. Eze at home to West Ham, I also really quite like the look of too. Anyway. On to Erling Haaland and whether or not triple captaincy could be a good option this early on in the season. I've seen polls on Twitter already that are showing 10-15% of managers saying they're going to use a triple captaincy chip on Haaland this week. Now, I don't think the engaged group is going to be that hot on it. I don't think it'll be 10-15%, but I do think a considerable portion across the entire player base will triple captain him. The reason being for that is a lot of managers at the start of the season are highly engaged and will drop off towards the end. And they also know that. They also know that this is their time to get off to a hot start. Loads of mini leagues that you'll be in this week will see managers that you wouldn't assume will last it to the end of the season. But they're highly engaged right now. And I wouldn't be surprised if you see two or three of your friends, your work colleagues, putting the armband and triple captaining Erling Haaland this week seeing it's Ipswich, seeing it's a home fixture and seeing that he's expected to probably play 80 to 90 minutes. It really isn't a bad idea. Objectively, it's a good, good time to use it. And that's why it is tempting. However, I'm probably not going to go there. I would say, actually, the likelihood of me personally going there is somewhere between one to five percent this week. The reason for that is, number one, double game weeks exist. We'll get them later on in the season. Yes, there will be far fewer double game weeks and far fewer big double game weeks this season. So there is a chance that we'll have more chips to use than we will have double game weeks. And therefore, maybe the triple captaincy chip would be the best chip to use in the single game week. And bench boost is usually very, very helpful in a double game week. So is a free hit. And of course, we've also got that mystery chip that none of us have any idea about right now. That could also be good to use in a double game week. 
And at the moment, we've only re realistically got two double game weeks later on in the season. So more chips than double game weeks. However, this early on in the season, Man City don't have their full playing squad back. They're definitely not completely up to full flow just yet. They've got their own injuries. Rodri's not back in training yet either. And whilst he is mainly useful from a defensive point of view and, and defensive sol uh, solidity, rather, there's also an element of Rodri helps set up the attacks and set, set up the, the systems of play and the different transitions that they use between counter-attack into attack. So what Rodri does provide to City is that balance and a structure to the way they play. And look, it's not like they missed him in game week one against Chelsea. So I still expect them to do really well against Ipswich. I still expect two, three, four goals. But is it worth triple captaining? I'm not so sure. I also think that the other argument against it is whilst Ipswich at home is a good fixture, and we can probably all safely assume that they will be one of the weaker defences, it's far too early on in the season right now to know for sure that they will be the whipping boys defensively. It could be Southampton. It could be Leicester. It could even be someone we're not expecting like a Wolves or a Brentford. We just don't know yet. And whilst we can make assumptions that Ipswich are going to be the team that are going to concede quite a lot of goals and quite a lot of chances, away from home last season, they were much more solid. They structured themselves in a very different way. They sat more behind the ball, not completely, but this was championship. So they will do so more this season, of course. And I can see a world where City have to struggle a bit to break them down for a while. Now, that's not every universe. In some universes, we see City win 5-6-0 because they get the early goal and they really start steamrolling and Ipswich lose their shape. So this could absolutely be a good week to triple captain. But I think the odds are that Ipswich are going to low block. They've got Greaves at the back who will probably match up man-to-man -man against Haaland. And whilst Haaland is clearly going to have the better of him over let's say 10, 10 different games, he would probably beat him in nine of them. It's not completely crazy to suggest that Haaland is maybe a little bit quieter against a big centre-back who's man-marking him in a three as well. So look, I'm going to captain Haaland, no question about it. For me, he's by far the best captaincy choice this week. But triple captaincy, when there are double game weeks in the future, we'll have more information in the future as to who the whipping boys are. City will be back at full strength and full flow later on in the season. And we'll have an away game against Ipswich. We'll have to play Southampton and Southampton and Leicester home and away as well, as well as potential other teams who might look weak. All of those factors must be considered. And then there's a psychological factor of, OK, this could go really well, but it could also flop. In any given week, any player on this spreadsheet could blank against any team. We've seen it happen a million times. We've seen Mo Salah blank in a 9-0 win against Bournemouth, for instance. It does happen even to the best players. And in a single game week, it wouldn't be completely outlandish to suggest that Haaland could blank against Ipswich. Not saying it will, but it could happen. And psychologically, burning a triple captain this early in the season could be a real psychological blow to your season and it takes a bit of enjoyment out of the game if it goes wrong this early. Now we really shouldn't be thinking about it in that way, that's not an objective way to think about it, but I think when I've got a really strong belief that there are going to be better opportunities or at least very least equal opportunities later on in the season to use it on Haaland, on Salah, I would personally urge caution and unless you're really really convinced i would say now is maybe not the time to go for it at least that's my own opinion let me know in the comments below whether or not you're considering triple captaining this game week i'm like i said around one to five percent likely to do it let me know in the comments below what percentage you are and whether or not that triple captaincy chip is active in your team okay so finally we're on to my team and to be honest there's not a ton to talk about because i'm not looking at using a transfer at the moment and it's a very similar team to the one i presented at the start of the video with my game week one side of course however there is one key difference in fact two key differences one being that 
Hall will leave my starting 11 as it stands for Robinson. Robinson comes in at home to Leicester. It was always part of the plan to rotate these two 4.5s. And I really like that home fixture against Leicester for Robinson. He looked really good against Man United, was in fact on for full bonus before they conceded. So he should be decent on the bonus, is creating a lot of chances down that left-hand side. And Leicester, for at least the first 45 minutes against Spurs, looked very, very weak at the back. So I am expecting Robinson to get chances. And there's a decent chance of a clean sheet there. So very happy to start him over Hall. But I still don't think Hall is a bad pick away at Bournemouth. I just think I've got slightly better in the defence. To round off the defence and in goal, no question about my keeper. It's going to be Raya. I'm going to start him every week, even against worse opposition or sorry, better opposition or a worse chance of a clean sheet. Away at Aston Villa, I don't think it's outlandish to suggest that Arsenal keep a clean sheet in that game. They conceded 0.8 XGC per 90 against even the best opposition away from home last season. So I like Raya this week as much as any keeper. Trent and Porro both got good home games this week. I expect attacking returns or at least the chance of attacking returns from both of them. Into midfield, Saka at the moment has my vice captaincy armband. I could put it on one of four or five right now, but Saka is so reliable. He's on penalties and gets good 80 to 90 minutes every single week. So it's a safe option. Fernandez as well, Brighton away. We know from seasons past he can score even after the full-time whistle has gone against Brighton. But joking aside, he is going to be a good option this week. Brighton looked pretty good defensively overall against Everton, but... That isn't withstanding the potential penalty that they could have conceded and the goal that was ruled out as well. So Everton, Everton's attacking data probably was a bit skewed by that and Brighton might have conceded a few more chances than the data actually shows. So Fernandez for me, very, very happy with him. Nkunku, as I mentioned earlier on in the video, will have a starting berth for me as long as he survives the Thursday night fixture without an injury and without... Even with 90 minutes, I think I'd probably start him if I'm completely honest at this point. Smith Rowe, Leicester at home, very happy with that. Same logic goes for Robinson as it does for Smith Rowe. Great home fixture. He should have more license to roam around in that more advanced 10 role this week than he did last week against Man United. And it does look like they're building up his minutes week in, week out at the moment. So I'm hoping for 70 plus. And even if he does get 70 against Leicester, I still think there's a decent chance of returns there. Up front, what I've done is switch to a three up front because I've got strong eight at, in midfield and up front. And what I've done is I've taken Minte out and I've put in Adam Armstrong. Now, Isaac and Haaland kind of pick themselves. I've already discussed Haaland being a triple captaincy option and that I'm definitely going to just be captaining him. So we don't really need to talk about that anymore. Isaac is absolutely locked in every single week as long as he's fit for me, regardless of the opposition. Just a great pick all round. Great data. Decent fixture, 90 minutes on penalties. He ticks all of the boxes imaginable. On to Armstrong though. Now, pre-season, I was hot on Armstrong. I am a Southampton fan, so of course there is bias there. But his data in the championship was fantastic. Data in game week one was also very, very good. He got, I think, five or six shots on goal. One big chance and 0.73 XG per 90, or in the first game anyway, so just XG. Um, so overall, a good option that I'm pretty bullish on for this week at home to Nottingham Forest. I think they'll concede chances. I think Adam Armstrong will be a focal point in that game. And because he's on penalties, because he's talismanic, and because we know that he's fit, as it stands, obviously we we'll have to wait for press conferences. I think he's the player that comes in for Minte as it stands. I'm also really bullish on Minte. I wish I could start each of them this game week because Minte looks like he's going to recover from his precautionary concussion substitution last game week and probably come back into the starting 11 for this game week and game week two. However, even prior to the season, even prior to the injury, I had mapped out in, in this game week, I would be starting Smith Rowe and Armstrong and benching Minte. The reason for that is quite simple. It's a slightly better fixture for both Armstrong and Smith Rowe. And even though I think Brighton are a better attack and Minte objectively or subjectively rather a slightly better asset or player than Armstrong overall. I think the fact that Armstrong is on penalties and you can more safely assume he's going to get 90 minutes is the swinger that just tips him over the edge and gives him the starting role for me. But with all that being said, I'm really, really happy to see both Minte and Hall on my bench 
ready to come on if any sort of panic ensues, maybe Nkunku does get injured or something really crazy happens with rotation or there's an injury we just don't hear about, then I've got options on my bench to come on and I'm honestly very happy with both of them. So overall, I think this week I'm pretty well set up. It's not perfect. I wish I had one more Liverpool player, for instance. I wish I had a Spurs attacker, but then again, Porro is kind of an attacker. Overall, though, I am pretty happy. Let me know what you think of my team in the comments below. And more importantly, what are your questions ahead of game week two? If you've got any key ones, do let me know in the comments below and how you think your team's going to do ahead of game week two. As we wrap up the video today, please do remember to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. That would be greatly appreciated. But in the meantime, good luck in game week two. And I look forward to seeing you back again next week as we start planning for game week three.